All right, so we're talking here about the fact that in the last decade, nutritional science has made radical advances, even flipped over, and people had to make tremendous changes in the way they think about eating for longevity, health, and disease. Welcome back to the Longevity Deprocess channel. We will learn from Dr. Joel Foreman, a visionary in nutritional medicine, renowned physician, and best-selling author of several cookbooks and books on living a healthy, long life. Dr. Foreman is the creator of the Nutritarian Diet, a powerful approach to eating that focuses on using nutrient-dense foods to promote longevity, fight disease, and enhance overall well-being. Dr. Foreman's Nutritarian philosophy is not just about what you eat, it's about creating delicious meals that nourish your body and protect against illness. Today, he's sharing some of his most innovative Nutritarian recipes from flavorful salad dressings and dips to hearty anti-cancer soups, comforting chili, and even decadent brownies that are as healthy as they are tasty. You'll learn how to create meals that are packed with the essential nutrients your body needs to thrive. Dr. Foreman's recipes are designed not only to delight your taste buds, but also to deliver powerful health benefits, helping you to ward off diseases and live a longer, more vibrant life. Join us as we explore the art of nutritarian cooking with Dr. Joel Foreman and discover how you can turn everyday ingredients into longevity-promoting, disease-fighting meals. Whether you're looking to revamp your diet or simply add more nutritious options to your meal plan, this video is packed with practical tips and delicious recipes that will inspire you to embrace a he. Othir Lifestyle Let's get started on the journey to better health with the power of nutritarian foods. Oh, and be prepared to do screenshots or take photos with your camera. Also, Dr. Joel Foreman has authored several cookbooks focused on healthy eating and the nutritarian diet. Be sure to share this video with yourself and others so that you can come back time and time again for more inspiration when looking to make a creative, healthy yet delicious meal. Oh. A quick favor, we'd greatly appreciate it if you can subscribe and like. This helps the YouTube algorithm recognize the value of our content and share it more widely. I find recipes confusing. Okay, so we're on this diet, we're eating lots of vegetables and lots of salads, and then we want to be able to make salad dressings and spreads that make vegetables taste good. I'm running off to travel or a plane, I might use a cauliflower wrap or a... Or a, or a Ezekiel wrap or something, and I put in there, you know, roasted peppers or avocado or roasted mar or cooked mushrooms in my wrap with sprouts and tomatoes and and um, whatever you know. And I'm a little. I'll put us. Maybe I'll put a pesto sauce on that or a marinara. Maybe I'll take my garlic nutter spread, which I'll take by always keeping a lot of roasted garlic along. So I'll take the whole head of garlic. Don't buy the garlic that already has the paper off it with a little um, cloves. Take it the whole head of the paper on because then when you cook it, it keeps the nutrients and moisture in better. So I'm saying roast the garlic, you know, at about 300 degrees for 30 minutes or 325 for 25 minutes. In other words, roast your garlic in the oven until it gets soft, but keep the paper on. And then when the paper's off, you can take your serrated knife and cut the edge off, which has the root, and you can squeeze it and pop all the garlic out. <laughs> Popping out, and you can take the roasted garlic out, because the roasting garlic is the secret to make foods taste great. And then I take that roasted garlic and mix in with maybe some hemp seeds or cashews, and make a, a garlic nutter. Maybe put some nutritional yeast in there. Make a great flavored dip. But now I can turn that garlic nutter spread into a host of different dressings. Right? I can put some basil and a little bit of lemon in there and turn it into a pesto sauce for the wrap I made for the plane. Or I can put some tomato sauce in there and a little bit of you know, fig or balsamic in there and turn it into a, you know, a marinara dressing. Or I can put some, a little bit of mustard in there or a little um, you know, um, basil vinegar, vinegar or um, um, what's it called? Lemon basil, yeah, lemon, lemon basil vinegar, a little balsamic vinegar, a little mustard in there, and make it into a garlic Dijon. I can turn that dressing into a million different dressings. Here's a quick grocery shopping tip. Only buy single ingredient foods such as nuts, seeds, veggies, fruit, herbs, 
spices, and vinegar. Then you will always have on hand the ingredients for several of Dr. Foreman's recipes. Also, this avoids cancer and disease causing processed food. It's not processed. Now, the doctor will explore a number of other recipes for dressings. You will want to take a photo of this or bookmark it. And I mentioned the orange sesame dressing there already, that I traditionally use those, where I take the sesame seeds and toast them very lightly, and half of them I put on the salad, and half I blend in with the cashews and the oranges and blood orange vinegar and a squeeze of lemon to make a delicious fruity dressing. Or I take just a tomato-based dressing based with tomato sauce. A lot of times I like to make my own tomato sauce because tomato sauce you buy in the store is too watery and has no flavor. I usually take some unsalted sun-dried tomatoes and buy a low sodium tomato sauce and plop the sun-dried tomatoes into the tomato sauce to thicken it. Or I'll take the tomato sauce and I'll put it on the stove on a low flame and cook some of the water out of it to thicken it. But best of all is growing my own tomatoes tons of tomatoes and saving them frozen in the freezer, huge amounts of tomatoes, growing as many tomato plants as you possibly can take care of. And then having lots of extra tomatoes, you can make your own sauce with garlic and onion in there and little basil, but really cooking it down in the slowest flame possible and cooking it all day long for like 10 hours to make a sauce that's much more flavorful and thicker than you could make. And I, of course, I'm using the skin and the seeds of the tomatoes. Some I'm coarsely grinding, but some I'm grinding more finely to break all the seeds and skin down. Not like an Italian tomato sauce where they throw the seeds away and they throw the skin away. We want to use the seeds and the skin in our tomato sauce, but you make a lot of this homemade tomato sauce. It's nice and thick. It's great for making salad dressings. And you mix some nuts or seeds in with it, a little black fig vinegar, maybe a little, maybe a drop of organic raisin in there, and you make an incredibly delicious um, sauce. Um, tomato sauce. And of course, um, ginger almond is a popular salad dressing. Walnut balsamic or almond balsamic is a popular dressing where people use roasted garlic, a little balsamic vinegar and almonds with a touch of raisin. When you're using balsamic, it's such a bitter vinegar that using a little drop of raisin in there helps make it taste better. Well, you know, if I'm using a chili dish with a chili, I'm not going to put raisins in there. I'm going to use organic currants because raisins are too big and you'll sometimes get a, one on your spoon and sometimes you won't. Currants are more expensive than the raisins, but if I'm using a chili or a vegetable dish where I'm putting some fruit in the vegetable dish or some sweetener to it, I'll use a natural currant because it's smaller and disperses that, that kind of sweet flavor throughout the dish much better. And of course, there's a blueberry pomegranate dressing or blueberry dressing with nuts and blueberry vinegar and some frozen blueberries is really great. You can make a mango dressing. You can make a strawberry dressing, all types of delicious types of salad dressings. Okay, here's a tip to save future meal prep time. Double or triple the recipe, then freeze the extra portions. Always write the recipe name on it since once it's frozen, it's impossible to identify. The following are low calorie dips and dressing recipe ideas. And you can make dips at night, which are low in calorie, like a salsa dip, which is made, salsa is usually made with peppers and tomatoes. Or like I said, I'll put a little bit of currants in the salsa. Whenever I'm using more spice, like oregano or chili powder, to make a, just a touch of spice in that um, bean salsa and chopping or blending um, a little bit of kidney bean or azuki bean there with tomato paste. Of course, the secret ingredient is the currants, not the raisins. And the most nutrient important ingredient is the scallion. Don't forget the incredible power that scallions have to prevent cancer. And tomatoes in general, cooked tomato products are very powerful anti-cancer effects. So the fact that you're making a tomato-based dip at night with some kind of little bit of spice, and we don't wanna heavily spice things because heavily spicing things can deaden your taste buds and make you no longer appreciate more subtle flavors. We want to only lightly, very lightly spice things. And then of course, to make hummus. And when you're making a hummus using chickpeas and sesame seeds, we wanna be use some baked eggplant in there to dilute the nutritional density to make a lighter hummus. You can eat it more liberally, so it's not so calorically rich. So again, the secret is roasted garlic, using lots of roasted garlic in the hummus with baked eggplant which you baked in the oven at 325 for like 35 minutes. And then you took or 45 minutes and then you took the skin off the eggplant because we don't want to eat, if it's been baked in the oven, we don't want anything darkened that had skin on it. 
You can you can, the skin of the eggplant when you're making stews and soups because you put water-based cooking, you're not burning it. But once you're baking it in the oven, you take the skin away. So scoop out the center of the eggplant, mix it in with your chickpeas and your sesame seeds, your roasted garlic, a little secret ingredient, some fresh horseradish um, with a little bit of lemon, makes it a really delicious hummus for your dip at night with the vegetables. Next up is Dr. Foreman's well-liked Caesar dressing recipe. But first, a fun fact. Caesar dressing was invented by Italian-American restaurateur Caesar Cardini. The story goes that Caesar Cardini, who owned a restaurant in Tijuana, Mexico, created the dressing on July 4th, 1924. According to the tale, the restaurant was running low on supplies due to an unexpected rush of customers, so Cardini improvised with what he had on hand. The result was the Caesar salad, featuring the now-famous Caesar dressing. The salad quickly became popular, and Caesar dressing is now a classic in many cuisines worldwide. Dr. Foreman will now give his healthy longevity version of Caesar dressing. And this, and this Caesar dressing always gets the great rating on the website. You don't have to use all these different ingredients, of course. You could use some of these ingredients. But, of course, remember, when we're putting in cashews, I'm going to put cashews and hemp seeds, not just plain cashews some tofu in there and a little bit of low sodium miso, a little bit of raw garlic, but lots of roasted garlic, a little mustard, a little date to sweeten it, and a little bit of kelp to give it that little um, seafood type flavor and a little nutritional easting lemon juice. People love this dressing. We serve this at the retreat a lot too, where people love the Caesar dressing. And we of course aliquot it out so people know exactly the amount of calories they're getting for each serving. And we use a, a you know, a, a have um, a salad dressing little bowl that holds your salad dressing. And so if you're making salad dressing in a Vitamix blender at home, you got to know exactly the amount of cat, um, nuts you put in it. So you make sure you're, you know, you know exactly how much to um, measure out for each day's use. And a lot of people like make some dressing or dip on a Wednesday and they'll use that same dressing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and maybe they'll Saturday make another dressing, make use that Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So in other words, we usually making enough and we're not cooking every night, eating leftovers for a few nights. Um, but it's worth it to make these great tasting dressings. The doctor will now describe one of his favorite vegetables and how to prepare it. And like I said earlier, artichokes taste so good and are so wholesome. They, they're high in protein. Right? And they're only 25 calories for a whole artichoke. And they're so high in protein and so filling. You can eat, you know, eat four, only two artichokes. I'll eat four, two artichokes, two whole artichokes, four artichoke halves, a whole artichoke. I'll take, you know, you touch the very bottom of the stem and the very top of the thorns off. And I'll cut the artichoke in half with a heavy knife. As you can see, exposing the choke in the heart. Cleaning the stem off, clean, so it's nice and smooth. And then taking a small knife, a small sharp knife, and cutting along the demarcation line between the choke and the heart. You see that moon-shaped line cutting deeply, removing those like fuzzy, inedible, plastic-like leaves and fuzz in the choke. So I'll cut the artichoke in half, take the choke out, and the little purple inedible leaves in the center come out and throw it away. And now I can steam that artichoke in boiling, get the water boiling, and then steam it above the boiling water for 18 minutes is usually sufficient or 20 minutes in a higher altitude. So the um, petals pull off the choke easily. If you're going to pull off the outer petal, it would come off the choke. And you eat the whole in the inner side of the, eat the whole small petals are edible and the whole choke and heart and stem are edible. And it's a food you can, that should be a regular part of your diet. I'll even buy frozen artichoke hearts and take them in a bag on it when I'm traveling. But I love artichokes and eat a lot of fresh artichokes. Next are the types of foods that the doctor recommends we incorporate in our diet every day. So reviewing here, we're trying to use these G-bombs in our diet almost every day. We can throw a dart at any of these foods and describe its magnificent anti-cancer longevity benefits. But cruciferous vegetables are the major, the utilization of cruciferous vegetables regularly, both raw and cooked, is another hallmark of what makes a nutritarian diet unique because of the strong relationship between the anti-cancer effects and the longevity promoting effects of cruciferous vegetables on lifespan and promoting us to our achievement to live to be, to live to be 100 years old. 
the highest quintile of cruciferous vegetable intake has the longest lived people. And cruciferous vegetables that remember have that cell membrane with that myrosinase in the membrane of the cell that then when you're chewing it, you're breaking open those little packets of myrosinase, mixing it with the clasinolates forming the isothiocyanates in your mouth. And the better you chew and leave here with the message that you have to liquefy your salad when you chew it in the don't, that make sure you liquefy every mouthful. Now, the doctor tells us about a fundamental recipe which you can use as a base for many different meals that has anti-cancer effects. That's my special recipe. And now we're going on to making a soup and I'm going to discuss how to make this anti-cancer soup because if you can make this soup, you can use the same methodology to understand the principles to make other soups. The point is, we're learning that the myrosinase enzyme is heat sensitive. So when I'm adding it to the soup, I want to take my bok choy or my broccoli rob or my mustard greens or my collard greens, whatever greens I choose, usually not kale, because my kids and family are eating so much kale otherwise that I would like to pick a different type of cruciferous green to utilize in the soup because it's not going to be noticed the flavor of it that much anyway. So the secret here, what makes it this anti-cancer soup and what makes you understand how I want you to cook it is I want you to take the green vegetable and I want you to blend it down into the blender while it's still raw. So you're breaking open those compounds so the myrosinase is intact and forms the ITCs in the blender. And then you can pour it into the soup to cook. So let me review. The first thing you did is you soaked your beans overnight. Then you put two quarts of water in a soup bowl. And it's in a big pot, two quarts of water in, and put your beans up to cook. Take your split peas and you put them in a separate pot, not in the same pot with the beans. Maybe put your cup of split peas and two or three cups of water into a separate pot to cook because they're going to cook quicker than the beans. You're going to cook, cover the beans and let them simmer now slowly. Of course, you soak them overnight. You rinse them off and you put fresh water in the pot. You didn't use the soaking water from overnight to put in the pot. You use new water in the pot when you're cooking your beans in a low flame. And now I have my peas cooking in a separate pot. And then once I get that cooking, now I can take my five pound bag of carrots and juice my celery and my carrots to make my stock. And I can take maybe a couple of quarts of vegetable stock made with carrot juice and celery juice and pour that into the pot now to cook. And now I'll put the, take the juicer and clean it and put it away. And now I'll take my Vitamix blender out and I'll take my green cruciferous, the bok choy, the collard greens, the broccoli rob, the you know, mustard greens, whatever cabbage, whatever green you're going to choose in your soup, you're going to put that, ladle a little of the liquid that's cooking in the soup in there. Not too much. Don't make it too watery. Just to make this puree of greens so we can let the chemical reaction that forms the isothiocyanates form in the blender. And then I can take this green puree and pour that into the base of the soup. Leave my blender dirty now and take my leek or my onion. Don't forget you cut the root in the one inch of the top off the leek and a little and and cut the root off the leek and now cut it down the middle the whole length of the leek so you can unravel it to take the dirt or the sand that settles into the deeper leaves and clean it out now i can cut the leek in half or a third with the onion i can fit that in my vitamix blender and lay a little soup liquid in there because remember the onion and leeks have that alienase enzyme you don't want to cook the onion or the leek first. You want to blend it while it's still raw. Don't forget, once you form the organosulfide compounds, once you form the isothiocyanates from the green cruciferous vegetables, they're heat stable in the soup. The soup would have prevented their formation because you would have deactivated the enzymes before the chemical reaction took place. But once the chem you get the chemical reaction that takes place in the blender, that makes it this anti-cancer soup because we're maintaining the viability and the formation of the anti-cancer compounds. So you, now you hook the onion and you made your, remember you made your form sulfenic acid and made your eyes burn and tear, keep the, the blender away from you and put, you know, make it smooth and pureed. Now pour that into the soup to cook. And now by this point, your peas are softened enough, the split peas cooking in a separate pot. You don't have to cook, change your 
change, you know, um, clean the blender, just pour your split peas and the water that the split peas are cooking on into the blender and add a little bit of nuts in there, a little bit of cashews and, and hemp seeds to add a little creaminess in the mouthfeel, add a delicious flavor of the soup and let that blend down into a puree in the blender and let that smooth and creamy and then pour that into the soup. So the beans are staying lumpy in the soup. <coughs> Now you can start to add the mushrooms, your chopped mushrooms, and I recommend people use shiitake mushrooms. Cut off the little dirt nib on the stem, but use the whole stem and the whole cap using your shiitake mushroom and one other mushroom. You want to use two types of mushrooms, shiitake and one other, shiitake and oyster, shiitake and trumpet, shiitake and white button, shiitake and lion's mane, shiitake and... Um, so in other words, pick your shiitake mushrooms with that chewy mouthfeel and pick some other mushrooms for the anti-cancer variety, right? And then you chop them up small and add that to your soup and cover your pot. And then you can add a little bit of nutritional yeast or veggie zest, your, your plant seasonings, you don't want to use too much. Um, if you're using something like Mrs. Dash, which has pepper in it, you don't want to use too much pepper. There's so many competing delicious flavors in this soup. You don't want to make it too peppery or spicy. You make just enough Mrs. Dash. So there's a hint of barely detectable pepper because you want that full different symphony orchestra of different flavors playing in your mouth. And then you, you're, by this point, it took you about an hour to make the soup, but you need to cook it for another hour on a low flame so the beans get very soft. You want your soup to cook for a full two hours. You want the beans to be under low boiling heat on a low boil on a low flame for a full two hours to get maximally soft. Then you can eat that dinner that, from that soup and take this giant pot of soup you just made and I clean out a shelf in my refrigerator, put a dish towel then on the shelf, I put the hot, the warm bowl of soup in the refrigerator, close it up, and the next day, all the leftover soup that's now cold, I now can take out of the soup refrigerator and I can aliquot it out into various containers for the week, even plastic containers. I didn't want to put hot soup into plastic, but I can put now that it's cold, I can put it into my plastic containers to take it so people can take it to work with them. Or you can just put it in glass containers or you can put it in individual containers that you freeze, or you can usually, we don't really freeze much of it because it, people eat it in the next three or four days. You know, it's always gone. We don't ever, it's never like more than three or four days. It's gone because it's so delicious. And I'm not saying to you that obviously that you, you can make different soups, one with more cabbage, one with more split peas, different types of squash soups and all types of different soups, but you still understand this basic principle of how do you make the soup by the beans cooking in the water first, you're doing the juicing second, you blending the onion and the green into your soup, and then you add the mushroom. This is your recipe. Here is the original Mrs. Dash spice mix ingredients. Onion, black pepper, parsley, celery seed, basil, bay marjoram, oregano, savory, thyme, cayenne pepper, coriander, cumin, mustard, rosemary, garlic, carrot, dried orange peel, tomato powder, lemon juice powder, citric acid, and oil of lemon. Next up is the doctor's chili recipe. It looks homemade. My own recipe. Okay, so glad you're getting a good understanding of that. And because we're eating, having people eat a lot of beans, Chilies are a great thing to use. Cooked tomatoes and peppers in with chilies are great things. We use, I usually take that extra firm tofu and I freeze it in the, in the freezer first. And I take it out of the freezer. And then when it thaws, crumble it. And it forms like a chopped meat like consistency where it's more rubbery. And you can mix it in with your rest of your ingredients. A little bit of chili powder. The secret ingredient is, c is cinnamon right? A little cinnamon in your chili, not that, don't make it that spicy. Add a little bit of those little currants to sweeten it. The currants do great with the beans and a little bit of almond butter in there. So, or you use just garlic nutter, the garlic nutter you made that's sitting in your refrigerator that has the nuts and the, gar and the roasted garlic in there. Or you could roast garlic and put a little almond butter in or take your garlic nutter. But of course, making a great chili is an important part of a nutritarian diet and people love it. And finally... Here is the doctor's recipe for a delicious dessert. This is my grandmother's recipe. And then desserts. You know, most of our desserts we eat and most of the desserts I eat are just like some frozen cherries at the beginning of the meal. 
as I started eating my dinner, I took some frozen cherries or frozen mango or frozen jackfruit or frozen, you know, something good out of the refri- or frozen mixed berries out of the freezer. So the time I get to the dinner part of the meal, it's like partially defrosted. It's not like you just took it out of the freezer and you're eating an ice cube fruit. It's not totally at room temperature either. So it makes it feel like you're eating ice cream. And then occasionally we'll have some kind of, you know, fancy or dessert, like a black, black bean brownie. We mix some beans with some dates and almond butter and natural cocoa powder and chia seeds with an, with an avocado icing or making another delicious type of dessert. Sometimes we have a little bit of a, a, a carrot cake or a papaya type sub thing in there. Next, watch the Dr. Joel Foreman Club playlist for more information on the nutritarian diet. Thanks for watching Longevity Deprocessed. Hit like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on evidence-based longevity tips. Share your thoughts in the comments. Your journey matters. Remember, small daily habits create big changes. Until next time, keep deprocessing for a healthier, longer future. Let's make this journey together.